All right, this morning we're looking at um, the rebellion, so to speak, the mob that formed in Ephesus when uh, one particular silversmith by the name of Demetrius got upset, formed a mob, and basically retaliated against Paul and his companions, but also how the Lord protected them. So let's begin reading this account in cha uh, chapter 19, verse 21, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. Luke writes, now after these things were, were finished, and again this is talking about the repentance on the part of the Ephesians because of the preaching of the gospel, now, Paul purposed in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, was bringing no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen of similar trades and said, Men, you know that our prosperity depends upon this business. You see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded uh, and turned away a considerable number of people, saying that gods made with hands are no gods at all. Not only is there danger that this trade of ours fall into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all of Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from her magnificence. When they heard this, oh, when they heard this and were filled with rage, they began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with confusion, or with the confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. And when Paul wanted to go into the assembly, the disciples would not let him. Also some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and repeatedly urged him not to venture into the theater. So then some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in, in confusion, and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. Some of the crowd concluded it was Alexander, since the Jews had put him forward, and having motioned with his hand, Alexander was intending to make a defense to the assembly. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, a single outcry arose from them all as they shouted for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And quieting the crowd, the town clerk said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there after all who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from heaven? So since these are undeniable facts, you ought to keep calm and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of our goddess. So then, if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a complaint against any man, the courts are in session and pro councils are available, let them bring charges against one another. But if you want anything beyond this, it shall be settled in the lawful assembly. For indeed, we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's events, since there is no real cause for it. And in this connection, we will be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. After saying this, he dismissed the assembly. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning. Now, we've been <clears throat> looking at the revival that the Lord brought to Ephesus and let's remember again what was going on here, the, the size and the importance of the city, uh, the number of people that were traveling to and from it, and the length of time that Paul spent there. Eventually through this, all of Asia heard the gospel. We saw how the Lord drew even more attention to his message by uh, allowing extraordinary miracles to be connected to Paul with people taking basically sweat cloths uh, from him and his work aprons, laying them on the sick and the demon-possessed, and they were being healed. How the message was further vindicated, remember when this group of 
Seven itinerant Jewish exorcists attempted to expel a demon from a demon-possessed man using Jesus' name, the one that Paul was preaching, only to have this man attack them and send them fleeing from the house, beaten and naked. Again, this, in the eyes of the people who heard about this, made them realize that, hey, there's something special going on with Paul. God of heaven is singling uh, him out. And how this not only struck fear in the hearts of the Ephesians, but brought many of them to repentance. Many who were involved in witchcraft turned to the Lord, confessed their sins, and publicly burned their occult libraries, which apparently uh, were quite valuable. What we saw happen in Ephesus was a work of the Lord, and what I want to point out or just remind us of is how different it is from the revivals that people often claim are taking place today. Maybe you don't come from a background where uh, churches believe that revivals were taking place, but, but I did. And uh, oftentimes they would identify perhaps, uh, you know, slain in the Spirit, uh, people speaking in tongues or people feeling that they're being healed and this warm feeling and things get a little bit more extreme as time goes on, uh, people laughing and barking and howling in the spirit. We know that these revivals are generally promoted by people who are greedy, who are basically greedy not just for wealth but also for recognition. But it doesn't have the character, obviously, of a genuine revival of God. A true revival of the Spirit shows the character of the Spirit. He promotes a genuine concern for the soul. He turns his people from the world to Jesus by giving them a real love for him and a desire for his kingdom. It changes their life. It, it turns them into something other than what these revivalists are actually are. It turns them into those who are like Jesus. So that's what we see happening in Ephesus. And really, this is what we need to be praying for in the world today, that God would revive our hearts and make us more like Jesus, and that He would also send His Holy Spirit to awaken and to convert many and turn them also into this path that our Lord calls us to walk. But our passage reminds us this morning that as we pray for revival, as we seek for revival, there is always a price that has to be paid. Because we realize that Satan, whose kingdom is being plundered, remember Jesus comes into the world, binds the strong man. That happens in his first coming. And that's the reason why people are being saved, is because Satan can no longer keep them captive. The Lord is freeing them. But as the kingdom of heaven advances and Satan's kingdom is plundered, we need to remember he doesn't stand idly by to let this happen. This morning, we see him again rise up to oppose God's work, but we also see God rise up to defend it. Okay, one thing that Jonathan Edwards pointed out during the Great Awakening is that Satan will try to stop these things from happening. He'll try to stop the progress of the gospel, and he'll do everything he can to keep people from going that direction, but when he sees that he can't stop it, he'll try to discredit it by driving it to extremes. Now, perhaps we've, we've seen some of that here, but we certainly see him trying to stop what is, is really, truly a work of God, but he can't succeed. Now, first of all, we see the enemy rise up or raise up opposition. When the revival in Ephesus began to taper off, we see Paul doing what he customarily would do. You know, if, if there's no more to be done here, then I'm going to go over there. I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to keep moving forward. And we see that compulsion in him here in verse 21. Now, after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem after he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. You know, Paul hadn't yet been to Rome. He wanted to go to Rome. Now, Corinth and Athens, as we were reminded last time, were in Achaia. And Berea and Thessalonica were in Macedonia. Paul wants to go back and revisit the churches that he had planted there to see how they were doing, make sure they're on track, and to encourage them in the faith. And he wanted to do that before he went back to Jerusalem, from which then he wanted to go see Rome. And remember, Rome was the capital, uh, the center of the civilized world. 
And if Paul could get the gospel to take hold of there, just think about how the kingdom of heaven would expand. And actually, he was, to a large degree, able to do that. But think about what happened in Ephesus. Ephesus was the large city, the capital of Asia Minor. And because the gospel took root there, all of Asia heard. If the capital of the world, uh, if it takes hold there, how much further would it go? Now, Paul had earlier written of his desire to go to the church at Rome, uh, as he says in first, excuse me, Romans chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. You know, there was already a church there because of Pentecost and some Jewish believers who came from Rome for the feast and returned there, but Paul wanted to go there as he did to other churches to make sure they're established in the faith, to make sure things were going the way they, they should be going. Now, it's possible the Spirit may already have revealed to Paul that he had to go to Jerusalem first before he would go to Rome. Perhaps he knew by the Spirit he was going to be arrested in Jerusalem and then taken on appeal to Rome, which is what we're going to see later. We don't know, but we know at least this much, that as our Lord Jesus Christ set His face to go to Jerusalem to lay down His life for us, Paul now sets his sights on Jerusalem that the message of what Jesus Christ had done in Jerusalem in laying down His life might come to the entire world. So to prepare for this trip, he first sent two of his companions ahead, Timothy and Erastus, while he chose to stay in Ephesus. And it was then that the enemy chose to attack. We read in verse 23, about that time there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way, the way being, of course, uh, the way of Christ. A man by the name of Demetrius, who was a silversmith by trade, called a meeting of his fellow craftsmen because their trade, the making of silver shrines of Artemis, was suffering. Now, Artemis was also called Diana uh, by the Romans, was considered to be the goddess of the forest and the hills. And her religion at that time was said to be perhaps the greatest rival religion to Christianity. It certainly was in Asia. As uh, Demetrius says, you know, her magnificence is known not only throughout all Asia, but, but throughout the entire world. Her temple that was built in her honor by the Ephesians was considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was massive. One commentator writes this, the archaic Ionic Temple of Artemis measured 220 feet by 425 feet with 127 marble columns, each 62 feet high. The lowest drums of the 36 western columns were carved with reliefs. The statue of the goddess was displayed in an inner room of the temple. Not only was it the destination of religious pilgrimage, but it was a banking depository as well. I mean, think about the dimensions of this when you try to put it in terms we can understand. This, this was a temple, a building, right? 220 feet by 425 feet. You know, a football field is only 300 feet long. This thing was not quite perhaps as, as deep as a football field, but it was wider than a football field and 62 feet high, at least the columns, and there were 127 marble columns. It was gigantic. Now, what these silversmiths were doing is they were making shrines, which were small copies of this temple, with a likeness of Artemis embedded in the center, and people would purchase them and take them home so that they could pray to Artemis and show their devotion to her, hoping, of course, to get some kind of favor. I'm not sure exactly what kind of favors Artemis could bestow, but they thought that by praying to her, it would benefit them. Now, Ephesus had become the center of this religion because of an image, the town clerk will say, of Artemis that had fallen from heaven. And we can only conjecture as to what that was. It was most likely a meteorite that had fallen to earth. They thought it came from heaven. It came from outer space. And as you know, rocks have sometimes, and especially meteorites, have lots of, you know, sort of hills and valleys in them. 
and somebody could make out what looked like a likeness of Artemis or Diana. And so they took this as a sign that they were favored by the goddess and they built this whole religion around it. These shrines, as we learn from our passage, were not only important to their religion, they were also essential to the economy. You know, Paul's ministry was threatening both of these things. You might say what the whole community was actually built on. Not only were their sales dropping along with their bank accounts and you might say their creature comforts, but their religion was beginning to wane. You know, people were turning away from Artemis because Paul was preaching that gods made with hands are not gods at all. And through this, again, a number of people were in their, in Demetrius' estimation, apostatizing and turning to the Lord. Now, let me just point out something that's quite obvious here. The first thing is the gospel is powerful, isn't it? If we promote the gospel, if we preach the gospel, if we share the gospel with other people, yes, yeah, sometimes they do get upset. There's a lot of people who do. But look at the effect this is having. It's turning the world so to speak, upside down, certainly shaking the economy and the religion of all of Asia, if not all of the world. Now, another thing we want to notice is this. When the enemy now rises up to fight against the gospel, he uses certain types of arguments to try to provoke these people uh, to fight against God, okay? Not only to keep people from coming to Christ, but also to attack his messengers, to identify Christianity as a threat. And by the way, as I looked at this, I couldn't help but notice the thing that Demetrius and the silversmiths were you know, concerned about are the same two things that everyone in the world is concerned about, their finances and their well-being after they leave this world. See, the gospel was attacking and overturning both of these things and so this is where Satan comes in to remind them um, uh, of, of the problem that they're faced with and so forth. But again, as we think about today, this is what we have to deal with as well because the enemy is going to come in to the people that we go to minister to and he's going to use the same two arguments against them to try to keep them away from the gospel. Now, the first one is he's going to tell them that the cost is too high that they'll have to give up too much, that they'll have to begin doing things the right way, and perhaps this is going to cost them in their business transactions. Now, perhaps um, maybe more to the point here, if they happen to have a business that dishonors the Lord, making of silver shrines to Diana, you know, if you become a Christian, can you still make silver shrines? If you become a Christian, can you, you know, run a bar? Uh, do you want to run a disco? I'm actually not a disco anymore, but a dance place or places where people gather and do things that maybe are not going to be promoting the work of the Lord. If you're a drug dealer or a, a pimp, I mean, there are certain things that, that go on in our nation that the gospel would overturn. And if you're sharing the gospel with someone like that and you're threatening their financial well-being, it will turn them against the gospel. At least the devil and their flesh will use that to turn them against him because they have to give it up. You know, the, the Lord also tells us that as believers, we need to give a portion of our income, what's called a, um, a tithe, to support his work. And some people don't want to give that up because it means less money. And less money means they won't be able to do as, you know, the things that they wanted to do before. You know, Satan will bring other reasons in as well to try to provoke them against the gospel, such as some of the fun things that they may have to give up. They won't be able to use their illegal recreational drugs any longer. They won't be able to drink except in moderation. They may have to give up their sexual activities. Maybe they like to gossip. Maybe they like to slam the government. You know, there's a lot of things that have to change, and people don't like to change. They like to do what they want to do. Well, again... God calls us to give our whole lives to Him. Jesus says we have to pick up our cross and pursue the things that have to do with the kingdom of heaven. And Satan will point that out and he'll remind people that that's not really what they want to do. And they're also going to have to confess that whatever it is they were hoping for after this life to be their security blanket 
And you know, most people, if they don't you know, believe in some false religion, some false god, at least believe the God exists will receive them on that last day because their good works will have outweighed their bad works. Well, they have to swallow, again, this, that God says there are none good, not even one. None of us are acceptable to God. All of us need to confess that, and we need to look to Jesus Christ alone, humble ourselves and receive Him. Now, Satan knows that that's a very big pill to swallow and that nobody can do it apart from the grace of God so he will use these arguments to turn people against Christ, against, against his messengers as well, and to turn them, of course, against Christianity. And really, these are the arguments that he's using here. And we see that he was successful. Demetrius called these men together, and after laying his case before them, he, they were filled with rage and began crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! Now, what are we to make of that? Well, it could be that the crowd was just a mob and couldn't think of anything more reasonable to, to do uh, to respond to this, and so they shouted out their mindless mantra. And this was a mindless mantra. This is the way they worshipped Artemis, simply by saying this phrase over and over again. Now, soon the whole city was worked up, and they became a mob looking for Paul. And when they couldn't find him, they took his companions, Gaius and Aristarchus, and dragged them into the theater. Okay, the theater was essentially an amphitheater, which was used for public gatherings that seated somewhere between 24 to 56,000 people. And let's not forget, if all the city is in an uproar, uh, the, the city of Ephesus was essentially uh, a city of some 300,000 people. So I would say the theater was likely full. Now, when Paul heard this, he was thinking, here's another opportunity to preach the gospel. He wanted to go in and address the assembly. But the disciples and the Asiarchs, and interesting, the Asiarchs are basically high-ranking officials in Asia. There were 10 of them, and they came from all the cities of Asia, and apparently more than one of them had at least become Paul's friend, which we're assuming they had become Christians but they also urged him not to enter into the theater. Now, I, I just want us to think about this. As we think about Paul and his desire even to stand before this mob to preach the gospel, consider the courage that Paul had. It's, it's an amazing thing. There was nothing that Paul would not brave, that he would not attempt to honor his Lord. And yes, he did suffer for it. I mean, he talks about in 2 Corinthians just, you know, the catalog of things that he had to go through. And he talks about at the end, I believe, of the book of Galatians, just how his body was, was like a, a catalog of scars uh, because of all the beatings, because of all the, uh, you know, the whippings and so forth and all that he had to go through. But yet, rather than looking at this and saying, I wish, you know what, I, as I look back, I wish I had done it differently. I wish I had been nicer, maybe presented the gospel in a more positive way, perhaps tell everyone God loves them, has a wonderful plan for their lives, and then they wouldn't hate me. Why did I take all this abuse for nothing? Well, he didn't take it for nothing, right? Because the gospel does offend. But rather than saying, I wish I hadn't, he said, I'm glad I did. Because this is an honor to be able to suffer in his place. Now, how does one actually gain that kind of courage and that kind of devotion? Well, it doesn't come all at once, but it comes step by step as we walk with the Lord. And certainly it begins by getting on our knees and praying, doesn't it? Praying and reading his word and asking God for the grace to begin to live this kind of life and then stepping out and talking to, to individuals, going through the different things you have to go through in order to see the blessing that actually becomes yours when you suffer for the sake of Christ. It does appear in Philippians 3 that Paul seemed to put a particular emphasis on the fact that he wanted to know Jesus, not just in the power of his resurrection, but also in the fellowship of his sufferings. It's when you suffer for the Lord Jesus that you are truly blessed. And the experience that comes from that outweighs anything else you're going to gain by spending time in your private devotions. You know, this was Paul's heart. And so he wanted to honor the Lord. He was willing to go in there. 
And again, that's what our Lord wants us to be striving for. We're never probably going to reach that point and be called upon to do something quite so magnificent, you know, something so perhaps even perilous as that. But the Lord has things for us to do, and we just need to be ready and willing to do those things. Now, in this instance, it was good that Paul listened to them because the meeting had gone into complete disarray. We read in verse 32, So then some were shouting one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion and the majority did not know for what reason they had come together. Again, they were just a mob following the crowd, herd, herd mentality. Eventually, the Jews encouraged Alexander, who appears just to have been basically an unconverted Jew, to speak, to address the assembly, and we're really not told why they put him forward. But when the crowd saw him, they thought he was the cause of this whole commotion. Uh, both the craftsmen and the Ephesians all knew that the Jews, even though they weren't Christians, were as much against religion, against their religion, as Paul was. I mean, the Jews didn't like the worship of Artemis, and we might also assume that maybe they couldn't distinguish between Christians and Jews. And so they, again they began to cry out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And that continued for two hours. They thought they were honoring their goddess who didn't even exist. They thought they were honoring her by repeating this over and over again. And remember what Jesus says in Sermon on the Mount in chapter 6 about prayer. When you pray, don't use meaningless repetitions as the, the, the heathen or the Gentiles do because they think they'll be heard for their many words. That's what he's referring to. Okay? So again, this is Satan's attack against the revival Stirring up the people against the gospel, that's something we need to count on. He is going to resist. He's going to push back. But secondly, we see God's protection. And God's protection comes in a variety of ways, and here it comes to the local authority, and that's what often happens. Now, when the town clerk arrives, and by the way, town clerk sounds like he was some cleric who worked outside of an official's office, basically filling out documents. That's, he wasn't a secretary, a lower, a lower level secretary, as the name suggests, but he was the one who was in charge of the city's money. He was the one who had control of the public assemblies. He was the one who communicated directly to the superiors. So he had authority, and he tries to talk some sense to this mob. Now what he does, he, he begins to try to attempt to calm them down. I mean, I think that's the best way to do it. It's kind of like Gamaliel. Remember when Gamaliel tried to calm the Jews when they arrested the apostles and they were on trial? He tries to settle them down. Let's just look at this reasonably, okay? Now, he tries to bring peace. And as I mentioned before in the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, this is really what our Lord has in mind when he says, blessed are the peacemakers. Those who bring peace among brethren. You know, we're, we're to bring peace in all different kinds of situations. Jesus was a peacemaker. He didn't try to stir up a crowd. He didn't try to turn the Jews against the Romans. Basically, he was preaching peace. He was trying to bring peace. So we are to try to calm volatile situations rather than throwing more fuel on the fire by agreeing with one side or the other and, again, stoking the flames. Now, the way he did it is interesting. First of all, he reminded them of the strength of their religion. You guys feel threatened? You shouldn't. Because everybody knows this is true. Everybody knows Artemis exists and we are the keepers of this image that fell out of heaven. Men of Ephesus, what man is there after all who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from heaven? So since these are undeniable facts, you ought to keep calm and do nothing rash. What are you saying is, is this? You know, we're undoubtedly right. Don't feel so threatened. Now, we know that he was unequivocally wrong, right? Uh, but since they were as deceived as he was, they took this as an argument, as a, as a valid point. Oh, you're right. You know, Artemis is real, so why should we feel threatened by this? By the way, I, I think there's a lesson here for us as Christians because the religion that Jesus has given to us, and again, we don't like the term religion because that sounds like something man-made, but Christianity, this is real. We should never feel threatened. We should have the solid assurance that it is insurmountable, that it is true, and we can 
defend it. Second, he points to the fact that Gaius and Aristarchus hadn't really broken any law, nor had they said anything directly against Artemis. I thought that was interesting. He says in verse 37, For you have brought these men here who were neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of our goddess. He means they haven't said anything against Artemis. Okay? What they've been doing is preaching the truth and not directly speaking against Artemis. Now, remember at um, Mars Hill when Paul addresses the philosophers and how he does it? He doesn't just go after them and their belief system. He doesn't attack the philosophers, their person and their lifestyle and basically talk about your fools and then go on to say, you know, your philosophy is, is basically a bunch of hooey. It doesn't make any sense. But what he does is he finds something in their belief system that they hold in common. And he uses that as a point of reference to begin to preach the truth. And of course, as he preaches the truth, it is going to reprove them, but it doesn't directly offend them. And perhaps there's a lesson here too with regard to how we should approach others with the gospel. I mean, if you're going to talk to somebody who believes differently than you, if you begin by attacking their beliefs, you're probably not going to get very far. You should begin talking about the truth, the gospel, and let the Lord make those applications. You'll probably find them raising questions saying, well, if that's true, what does that mean about this? What does it mean about that? Third, he reminded them that there was a lawful way to deal with this situation, verses 38 and 39. So then if Demetrius and the craftsmen who were with him have a complaint against any man, the courts are in session and proconsuls are available. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you want anything beyond this, it should be settled in the lawful assembly. So essentially he's saying, gentlemen, let's do things the right way. We have a law. We have courts for a reason. If you think they've done something wrong, bring your case before the court and let them decide. Remember, that's the reason why these things were established, was to take care of situations like this, of one neighbor to another. Even our Lord tells us, you know, don't think eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Your neighbor does something to you that's wrong. If he knocks out a tooth, knock out his tooth. But essentially, he says, if you need to, take him to court, let the courts decide, but don't take personal vengeance. That's essentially what this guy's saying. Fourthly, he warned them of the consequences they might be facing because they had already broken the law in verse 40. For indeed, we are in danger of being accused of a riot in connection with today's events, since there is no real cause for it. And in this connection, we will be unable to account for this disorderly gathering. In other words, we can't justify what we're doing. You need to be concerned that this is going to come back on you. So make them feel a little bit afraid. They have broken the law, and they can look forward to some consequences. And then finally, he dismissed them. His counsel calmed them down. He was able to send them away, and no harm was done. You know, that is the reason why God has ordained government. You know, this is actually the right use of, of government, to promote peace, and the general welfare to protect a person's rights, to encourage those who are doing right and punish those who are doing wrong. Now, sadly, all governments don't always work that way, and it doesn't always turn out to protect those who are actually promoting God's truth because sometimes God ordains that we must suffer so that the kingdom of heaven might advance. But at least in this case, it did. God used the government to protect Paul and to protect the church that was developing throughout Asia and throughout the world. Now, the one thing we can always count on is that God will always work for good in the situation that we were involved in. Okay? He will overrule all things for our personal good. Even when Paul was beaten, he still considered that to be good because he glorified the Lord and he was going to get a reward in heaven for that. He will work it together for the good of His church. He will basically cause His church to grow. It doesn't grow during easy times, during you know, what we consider nice times. It usually grows during persecution. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if this war in the Ukraine will bring many people to saving faith 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's a number of nominal Christians there who are a part of the Russian Orthodox Church, Eastern Orthodoxy, but that's not a true church. They don't preach the gospel. Uh, maybe many will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ through the preaching of the gospel because it's when things get really tough and the world gets shaken that people begin to look outside of themselves to the one who can actually help them. And God will also work through these things to bring glory to Himself. He will glorify His name and His grace as the gospel breaks through and pushes away the system of works that basically everybody has. Every false religion is a religion of man's works. God will glorify His grace through the, the gospel of, again, His free grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to learn from these things to trust the Lord. You know, not to be afraid, but to be courageous, knowing that, again, even if we get into a situation that isn't comfortable, that God is going to use it for His glory and for the advancement of His kingdom, and He will work it together for our good. Well, may the Lord bless His Word uh, to us to build us up and to encourage us to go in that direction. Well, let's, let's uh, bow in a moment of prayer.